Hosting for the Dice Tower is generously provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 488. Ending of the Year. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Tom and I attempt to close out 2016 with an empty mailbag. Can we do it? In addition to your questions, we have a trio of tales to share, and of course, another batch of games to discuss. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Carson Daly of board gaming, Tom Vassell. Why am I Carson Daly? Well, because uh, I already said you were Ryan Seacrest and Dick Clark in previous years. Does Carson Daly also do something on New Year's Eve? He does, yes. Who cares? I'm running out of suggestions. (laughs) We we can't do New Year's episodes anymore unless I just start uh, recycling. Well, I think this is our last episode of 2016, right? I, I believe it is, yes. Yes, it is. So, okay, so I hope you had a great Christmas, happened. everybody, and happy oh, New this, Year. This means I'm going to blow stuff up soon. So excited. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, uh. we actually we had an extended discussion today as what would happen if the fireworks all went off in my garage? Hmm. And what would happen to all the games that were down there waiting to be reviewed? That um, would be a problem, wouldn't it? Yeah. But uh, let's not think about that. Okay, so... <laughs> First of all, folks, we want to encourage you to next week, um, next Tuesday, hopefully, that's that's the date for it, a week from today, at least when this goes, the 2nd of January, is when our fundraiser starts on Indiegogo. It is, uh, if, if you like the Dice Tower and we've done anything that you think is worthwhile supporting, we encourage you to support us there. The show is on because of you guys. We'll talk much more in detail about it in our next episode. Um, but... We, we want you guys to get involved. We, uh, we always will try to make our episodes free. We don't have any secret content for people who pay. If you can't pay a dime, it is what it is. We're not ever going to you know, look down on you or think you're less of a listener for that. But if you can pay a dime or 10 times that or you know, 1,000 times that, your choice, um, we want you to consider that. So that's coming up January 2nd. We hope to see you there. Keep in tune with the dice tower dot com or our Twitter or Facebook accounts and we'll announce all that information there as soon as we can. But that being said, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summer. Hello. And we're gonna start off by talking about a pile of games. And I want to go first because I'm super excited. Okay. So Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shadows of the Past. Yes. Okay, so this game, I mentioned this last episode as one of my 10 favorite of the year, mm-hmm. and I'm really, really enjoying it. Uh, it comes with a whole pile of plastic miniatures as normal for these style games. But the game takes place, it's kind of interesting, it, it's, there's four books in the game. And each book is broken into four or five scenarios. And each scenario it consists of, you don't have to like set up a whole map, there's just two boards, two square boards. So hmm. you pick whatever two boards it shows, and you might add a few terrain pieces on the boards like trash cans or um, uh, sewer lids uh, <laughs> that you can throw at people. Nice. And then there's like a story. So when you, when you play the first one, it might say, okay, go to uh, mission number two, depending on if the turtles won or if the bad guys won, this might happen. Or if the bad guys won, go to mission three or whatever. And there's a storyline. There's even a little comic strip sometimes to show what's happening in the story. And so the turtles are going to go through Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo, and Donatello. And they are working together against the bad guys. And it's your typical move around and fight stuff. And one person controls the bad guys. But the good guys each have dice. They have these three dice that they roll. And each turtle has different dice. And when you roll these dice... Those are the actions you will take, although you can pay some tokens to re-roll the dice. But then you have three dice in front of you, but you have five actions because you take your three dice actions on your turn, but you also take the die to the left of you of that turtle and the die to the right of you of that turtle. Hmm. So how you place your dice matters because you'd be like, oh, you need some movement? 
I'm going to put this die over here next to you so you can use it. Now, this is except for Raphael. He's a loner. Hmm. He doesn't take anybody's dice. However, he rolls six dice. Hmm. So there's that. Um, and it's really cool because uh, Michelangelo is the guy who can, you know, he's the most maneuverable by far. Raphael is the strongest one. And I'm about to mix the other two up. One of them's a leader. <laughs> and, and one of them's good at defense. I, uh, Donatello and Leonardo. I remember which one's which. I think Donatello is the leader. Ah, I'm all confused. But I think Leonardo is the leader. Yeah, maybe. The thing is. They fit their characters, and I don't know that it, – it looks like it's based on the comic strip, not the TV show or definitely not the movies. Okay. And then sidekicks can show up. There's April, and there's Casey Jones, and there's, uh, of course, Splinter and the pizza delivery guy for whatever reason. <laughs> and there's – it's – it's really not much more than that, right? It's not. There's special abilities. Each one has abilities. You could do things like slide down a railing and hit everybody next to you. You know, there's some cool turtle maneuvers that can be done. Hmm. And but it's not like a dungeon crawl where you're going through and picking up weapons. But there is on a roof, jumping off into the trash bags and then fighting these guys. And the bad guy keeps spawning more people, and you're trying to beat them. And the bad guy has a really cool deck of cards that shows him which bad guys he can activate each round. It's a solid system, and I really like the teamwork aspect of those dice. That really shines in this game. Hmm. It's it's really neat. Uh, I I really enjoy it. I like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'm not a huge fan of them. I, I'm just kind of like uh, enjoy them. But I think it's just it feels like ah oh, good because it feels like almost every one of these kind of games anymore is either fighting aliens, goblins, or demons. Here you're fighting foot ninjas, <laughs> ah, something different. But it really does have that different feel to it. It's more lighthearted, but not too lighthearted because the comic of Team NT is not nearly as silly as the TV show was. Right. So also a comic book comes in the box. But really, really liking this one a lot. That's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shadows of the Past from IDW, designed by Kevin Wilson, the same guy who did Descent. Interesting. I mean, this sounds like one that might be a nice jumping off point from Mice and Mystics as far as a, a co-op I can play with my kids. You know what? That That's true, except that this is not a co-op. Remember, one person has to play the bad guys. Uh, okay, yep. So you could be the bad guys, and you could play them almost. You can play to win, or you could play, I guess, as a, as a dungeon master. That would be up to you. Gotcha. Well, uh, my first game is one I also mentioned in my top 10 last week uh, of the year, and that's Great Western Trail. Uh, this is from Stronghold Games, and uh, you are moving along the Great Western Trail trying to bring cattle from one end to the other where you will then sell them. And your cattle are represented by a deck of cards, uh, and you'll, you'll draw some. And you'll visit various action spaces along the way. Ordinarily, you get to move four spaces, and at first the trail is pretty open. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot in your way, uh, and these action spaces will let you sort of rejigger your hand of cards. You get to discard cards, uh, use some of them to earn you money, uh, and then you'll draw back to your hand limit at the end of the turn, and eventually you're hoping to have culled your, or, or cultivated your hand into something that's going to earn you as many points as possible at the end of the trail, because the more you are able to earn, you need to have unique cattle in your hand, uh, and then they're numbered. Each card is numbered, and whatever value you've got, that's how far you can move along the railroad and sort of place a scoring marker down there, earn points, uh, end game scoring there. You're sort of prepping for, for that. Um, and so you want to get the best hand possible. One of the things you can do is to place buildings down, uh, which not only give you more action spaces to hit on the way along, but it also slows down your opponents. It's one more space for them to hit as they move along the trail. Also, there are uh, little hand icons that force them to pay you to pass certain buildings. So if you place one in a bottleneck, you're going to get money from everybody uh, as they go by, which, which can be very nasty if uh, you're not one that's been placing buildings and have to pay your opponents all the time. There's also ways to move a railroad train token around the scoring track, which, which allows you to place down more scoring tokens at the end of the game, also makes it cheaper to, uh, to deliver your cattle. Uh, there's also a cowboy uh, route you can take in culling your deck and adding more cattle to your deck, making it more lucrative every time you make it through the sequence. There are lots of options 
You can gain personages into your board、uh, to to make it、uh, more more powerful when you trigger some of these actions, like the railroad baron or or the cowboy or the builder that makes it easier to put down buildings on the board and upgrade those buildings.、Uh, there's also ways to upgrade the actions on your board.、Um, That so when you trigger a particular action, you may be able to do it twice, or open up more powerful actions that let you call cards from your deck, or earn money in various ways, move your railroad thing around the board. Lots of options、uh, to to customize your empire, increase your hand size, make your movement around the board more uh, more speedy, uh, increase your movement. Lots of options, and therefore, as Tom mentioned last week. Can be a little brain burning, but I like having all those options. I like making my path more efficient,、um, and and I kind of like the idea of of draw, drawing a hand of cards, spending some of those cards, trying to make my hand better for when I get to the end of the path. It also has that aspect of how fast do you move along? You get to move at the beginning four spaces, but there's so many cool things to do along the way. I mean, I want to hit all of these spaces, but that means you're sort of behind the curve. And the faster you can get around the board and get to the end and get back to the beating and get back to the end,、uh, the more money you're going to make, the more efficient you're going to be, the closer you're going to be to victory,、uh, as opposed to your opponents that are moving slower. Neat game, and and I think one that I'm going to、uh, really enjoy exploring in the future. Great Western Trail, big thumbs up. Yeah, I I I, I hope. When I said brain burning, I hope that, I, I didn't mean that as a negative thing.、Mm-hmm. I do like the game. I like to think sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. But but speaking of thinking, Gooseberry. <laughs> <laughs> Gooseberry is a little game that I got at Essen from the same designer of Coup, actually.、Um, and Gooseberry, did you have you played Gooseberry, Eric? I don't remember if you did or not. No, no, I didn't play this one. Gooseberry is like a mix of Spyfall and、um, Link, the L I N Q. If you remember that game,、mm. I don't know if you ever played that one. No. In in in、uh, in Gooseberry, you put a bunch of there's a, I want to say there's like twenty words in the table, and all the words are the same category. So they might be all cities of the world, or different foods, or whatever. Right? They're different things. And then everyone gets a card given to them randomly. One person says, "You are the Gooseberry," and everyone else's will show like this chart. So then you roll two dice, and on that chart it gives you coordinates, so you know what the secret word is. Everyone has the same secret word, but the gooseberry has no idea what word it is.、Hmm. And then everyone looks at the words for a while, including the gooseberry, and they think and think and think. And then we say, "Okay, we ready? Go!" And then everyone, one after the other, says one word that has to do with that word that they're trying that that's on the card, including the gooseberry, who's just making a word up and hoping it fits.、Hmm. After that has happened. Everyone then votes on who they think the gooseberry is, because someone's word did not make any sense.、Mm. However, that does not matter if they get the gooseberry correct. They they win. Well, not yet, because then the gooseberry can think they can say, "I think I know what the word is," and point to it. And if they're correct, the gooseberry wins. Ah, so you're purposefully trying to get a word that connects, but not too on the nose. Right. You need like, for example, we played a game where the word was eggs, and a guy said Arnold. Which was a good clue, because eggs Benedict Benedict Arnold. Oh boy! <laughs> yes, but since I knew the word was eggs,、mm-hmm. and he said Arnold, I was able to figure out. Oh, okay, that guy's okay. But if I for the the gooseberry, the gooseberry didn't know that because they didn't know what the word was. Right. So Arnold meant nothing to them. So that was a good clue. But there was a time where I was the gooseberry, and the clue was USA. And someone said Elvis, and someone else said Vegas, someone else said LA. I was like, hmm, this is not hard. <laughs> <laughs> so,、um, yeah, it, that, that's an interesting. It, it, it's an interesting dynamic. It's very similar to Spyfall in a lot of ways.、Uh, I like it. I'm hoping a publisher picks it up and prints it. That's Gooseberry. Okay. Next up for me is、uh, one of the Oink games, and I think this was in the first wave of Oink games. It's called Deep Sea Adventure.、Uh, you are a diver,、uh, and you're in a crew of divers that all share the same oxygen supply. I think you start at twenty units of oxygen, and you all start down a, a big path of tokens, and the tokens get more lucrative as you get farther down the path.、Uh, you, you'll sort of enter. Waves or, or phases、uh, where you can tell that there's a wider range of points when you reach a certain threshold, and it's a roll and move game. 
you first decide、uh, if you have any treasures in front of you, you will lose one oxygen for each treasure that you have in front of you. But at the beginning, no one's picked up any treasures. So you say, "I'm continuing down," and you roll the dice, and they're modified dice. I think one through three on each of the faces,、uh, and you're rolling two of these dice, and you move that number of spaces. And it's kind of like.、Um, You know any of those games where you you leapfrog over other people. So if you're playing with six players, there's maybe a lot of people on the track already, and you're jumping over them. Yay! I'm making progress. I'm going super deep. And then you decide whether you want to pick up that treasure or not. However, if you do, when it gets back around to you, you will start losing oxygen.、Mm. And with multiple players, you're losing oxygen more quickly, maybe a little more quickly than you think. And you're not able to make a decision that you're going back up until you get to your next turn. And you say, "I'm going back up." So you've collected a couple of treasures, maybe, and you decide to go up. But meanwhile, your teammates have done that too, and you can't look at the point values that are on these treasures until you make it to the boat. And you're hoping to make it back to the boat before oxygen runs out, because if it runs out, anyone that's still down is out. They don't earn any points that round. They must be rescued, I guess. Um, but if you make it up, you get to look at your tokens and you you reveal them,、um, and you do this. And any blank spaces then get compressed, and you start another round. So now it's easier to get to those higher scoring tokens. And anybody that was carrying treasures and、uh, died or passed out that round, their treasures drop to the bottom as a stack. So now that's just a single treasure that's now worth quite a few points, perhaps. So now there's all this incentive to just dive all the way to the bottom. But if you do that, you're going to die because you won't have enough time to get back up to the top. So it's a real、uh, push your luck aspect. And the more players you have, the quicker that can turn, and the, that oxygen track starts to move a whole lot faster than you expected. I found it a, to be fun. It's it's very light, very simple. Um, but and it's one of the Oink games, which is a very small package and relatively expensive for what you're getting. Still, fun game, deep sea adventure. Hmm, I'm interested in this one now. Oh, you haven't played this one? I don't think I have. Hmm. All right, we'll go ahead and do another one because my next game I want to talk with you at the same time. Sure.、Uh, well, this is a dice game. This is the the Lagranja dice game. From Stronghold,、uh, no siesta. It's called. Each player、uh, gets a, like you can never take a nap. I think so. It's. I don't know why it's called that because one of the tracks is the siesta track, and the way that you trigger end game is by getting to the end of it. You want to have a siesta. Maybe、uh, someone's any, saying, "Don't do it," and you're fighting the power. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's what's happening.、Uh, this. This is、um, not really a direct connection to Lagrania. It's more of a thematic. Connection. You are buying and selling goods,、uh, you know, at market and at, in long range. You're sort of doing the same things that you do in Lagrania, but you're not、uh, doing them in the same way. If that makes sense. There are a bunch of dice,、uh, and they all have different commodity symbols on them. And、uh, the start player is going to roll all of the dice and then draft them.、Uh, so they get one die, and then the next player picks one. The next player picks one until it gets back to the start player. They then roll all the remaining dice. And you go back around, so you've picked two dice, and that leaves one die left.、Uh, it's all based on the number of players, how many you're, you're rolling, and then everybody is going to get the result of that third die. When you claim a die, you put a disc onto a little commodity board that's in front of you.、Uh, so you've got olives, and you've got wheat, and you've got、uh, grapes, and you've got donkeys, and you've got pigs, etc. And you're putting discs on these things. And then once everyone has put their discs on those things, claimed all the dice, then you, for each disc you have on your board, you can then tick off a little segment of your scoring sheet. And your sheet is divided into sections. You've got the roof building.、Uh, you you spend money to build roofs. And if you do that, you you will score points for one, but also get some sort of one-time ability. You can check off a bunch of boxes to get a helper, which gives you a permanent ability、uh, for the rest of the game. You can do long. Distance deliveries, which are like triples. If I deliver three donkeys at once, I get to check this off, which is worth points.、Um, there are market carts that you fill in order. So I might have to do、uh, olives, then wheat, then grapes, then olives, then wheat, then grapes again, and then a donkey. And、uh, those usually require a donkey in order to deliver them. If you do that before everybody else, is kind of like a Uh, roll through the ages thing. If you complete a cart before other people, you get more points、uh, than they will if they complete it later. 
Those also let you do some endgame scoring, uh, placing one of your market discs on this endgame scoring board, which removes it from your ability to use it, but also gives you points at the end. You can get more discs by working your way along this siesta board, as I mentioned. Uh, if you get little hat symbols, you can move along this siesta board, which eventually unlocks more discs for you to use, and pushes endgame. Because once somebody gets to the end of that, you finish off that round, and that's going to be it. Uh, there's also uh, stables and... Uh, market warehouses that you get points for filling in columns there. Essentially, just a whole lot of ways to earn points. And you're doing that through the the income of the, of these resources, the drafting of the dice, and making sure you have enough discs to be able to acquire those resources as efficiently as you'd like and use them in the way you want. You can keep one disc from round to round, so you can sort of plan ahead or um, earn wild commodities by completing certain sections of your board. You're just trying to check off as much as you can in the best order. And eventually somebody wins or somebody gets to the end, you total up points and, uh, and determine a winner. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it's, it's fun. It uh, moves quickly. Uh, it, it offers interesting choices. Um, and yeah, there's the luck of the roll, but you're not totally beholden to it. I do think the hat action is extremely powerful. Um, we had one guy who grabbed the hat every chance he got and it's almost like you should you almost need to grab a hat every time you have the opportunity to because you're going to be way ahead of everybody else on that siesta track which breaks ties for one thing and also unlocks more of your discs so you're sort of in control of the game if you're using that and and i i'm always a little worried when there's an action that's that powerful but there's also lots of other things to do if you don't get the hats. And you're always earning something on around as long as you still have discs to spend on it. Um, I did like it. I, I'm, not, I'm not in love with it. But it is, it's a fun game and it certainly moves more quickly than La Grania. Um, so if you're, if you're looking for a quicker market commodity game and you like dice rolling, uh, no siesta's worth a look. I liked it. It's a good game. No question. Okay, I... Uh have uh, had some disagreements with Eric on the game Pokemon. Got to catch them all. Got to catch them all. Yeah, well, it's hard to catch them all. They just released some new Pokemon, Pokemon Go, but I think you can only get them from eggs. Mm, I, I think that's the case. Yes, anyway, there's a special Christmas Pikachu. I have not seen him anywhere. He's hiding. Whatever. I, I don't understand why they can't just add another 100, 100 Pokemon. I'm, I'm about to quit the game. Because they're waiting. For what? But I don't know. Anywho, um, so I played Pokemon when it came out, and I want to say that was in 97, maybe? Uh, I think it was 99. The year I got married. That might be right. Either way, it's been a long time since the yeah. game came out. When the game came out, I did not really like it that much. I was a lot. I was very involved in other CCGs at the time, and I was like, ah, this game's too simple, and I've given Eric a lot of garbage about it. For some reason, Pokemon contacted me and wanted to know if I wanted to review the newest set, Pokemon XY Evolutions, I think it's called. Yes, that's and what, yes. since my daughters are kind of big into Pokemon Go, I was like, hey, yeah, why not? Let's get it and play it. Well, huh, it's actually a decent game. <laughs> and it hasn't changed. In fact, this newest set is like almost the same as the old, the original set. Uses a lot of the same artwork, a lot of the same Pokemon. I actually knew most of Pokemon because most of them are in Pokemon Go. Mm -hmm. It added a few extra things like super charge up cards now. Whatever, like they can get super powerful. I think the reason I haven't liked it all these years is because when I played it, I was playing a lot more complex CCGs. And I played Pokemon and I was like, what is this? This is too simple. I want to play, you know, I don't want one Pokemon at a time. I want four. Why would you mm. be fighting one on one? That's stupid. And now I'm more of a fan of simple games. So it is winning me over more i still don't think it's a great game i think there's still the problem in the game that if one person gets a very powerful pokemon out you might as well just call the game over at that point do you disagree with that i i'm not I'm, i mean yeah, it can feel like that sometimes if you're not able to get an equally strong pokemon ready to go yes it can be difficult uh to to combat um a very strong pokemon that doesn't reduce their energy at all if they're able to charge up their major attacks and and this is one issue i've had with the more recent version of the game is there are these ex pokemon which one are basic i mean the game used to be about building sort of 
with a tree in your deck, you'd have the level, the basic Pokemon that then evolve into stronger level one Pokemon that then evolve into stronger level two Pokemon. And you had to work your way up to get to these very strong characters. Now there are these EX cards, which are strong to begin with. They may need a good amount of energy to do what they do, but you can bring them out immediately. And within two or three turns, you're able to do some significant damage with them. They are worth two prizes if you knock them out. But if you're facing an EX Pokemon with standard, regular, basic Pokemon, you're, you can't go toe-to-toe with them. You have to uh, find ways to remove their energy. You have to deal with them in other ways, get them asleep or paralyzed or confused. Well, what is this, what is this removing energy thing? Is there cards that do that? There are attacks that remove energy. Um, you you no. really need to build your deck around having to deal with EX Pokemon. And my, so the reason why I wanted to talk about Pokemon today is, is that my son, who is a fan of watching the TV show recently, but this is my youngest, the five-year-old, um, I, I thought he would enjoy bringing out my old decks from 99 and 2000 uh, that my wife and I put together when we first got married and said, hey, check out these cards. And he's looking through my deck. Oh, it's Pikachu. And here's Bulbasaur. Like all of the, those generation one Pokemon are in my decks. Uh, and these are the same ones that are now part of this XY Evolutions set. They're updating the classic cards to fit better with more modern decks. So it uses the same art, but they've upped the HP on the cards or made the attacks more powerful, uh, just sort of updated everything. And he now is head over heels with Pokemon and wants his own deck, and I, I think they're asleep. Uh, they're going to be finding some Pokemon cards in uh, under the tree. Uh, this holiday season, um, I went. We went to Cool Stuff for the party before the cruise, and the the uh, gentleman behind the counter talked me into buying some of the um, championship decks. So every year after the World Championships in Pokemon, the the company releases an exact replica of the decks that won the competition. They're put out in like a special edition that's not competition legal, so you can't just get this to get all the cards that are in there. But it does it does give you a way to see what competitive decks look like, as opposed to the basic decks, which are fine and are good at teaching the game. We actually got a starter deck for my youngest that you're not supposed to shuffle. You you actually work your way through the deck and it teaches you how to play your first game, and then once you've done that, you shuffle them all together, and now you have a sixty card deck. But these championship decks are really interesting. And right now, I'm the only one in the family that has opened his because the others are supposed to be under the tree. So right now, I'm beating my kids to a pulp with this game. And um, that'll change once they get their championship decks. But for now, for like another week, I'm still good. Hmm. Well, I'm not going to start collecting this stuff. That's all I'm saying. Well, if you, um, if you need to get rid of your cards, I, I, you know where to find me. I didn't say I wasn't going to not collect it either. I haven't decided. <laughs> it is it is a fun game, and I'm really enjoying getting back into it. Uh, the one thing that's really good with my son uh, is that he is – he's been a little tough to get interested in reading, whereas my elder son was all over this stuff. But Pokemon has him reading the attacks, reading what the action cards do, and he's doing that – fully on his own and excited to do it. So as an incentive to get him reading more, this has been really good. So I'm going to encourage that as long as I can. All right. Well, folks, the Dice Tower is a show about games, but especially the people who play them. And I really believe that. I mean, we want to make it, you know, the games are important, but like, for example, when we were just on Dice Tower Cruise and we haven't really talked about Dice Tower Cruise much, but well, we did on our show that was at the Dice Tower Cruise. We did, yeah. But it was just an amazing time. And I played some really good games in the Dice Tower Cruise. I, I, I went on my way to play my favorite games, mostly. I didn't mm-hmm. play any game I didn't know. I just played games that I knew were fun. I taught games. But I just had fun hanging out with other gamers. It was an amazing time. Uh, it really was just the, – the dinners were my favorite part. So I, I would say that's – most of my meals, I'm not even sure we talked about games. <laughs> and so that's a great time. And, and I like to hear stories about gaming, too, and things that happened. And so these tales are not going away anytime soon. I know some people don't like them, but I love them, the different tales that we have. But we need more. 
Now, remember, some tales I don't play, and if you don't hear yours played, it's because, well, I just made the call to play it or not. Right. I'm not necessarily looking for you saying, we beat this game at the last second. I almost died, but we won the game. That's kind of cool, but I'm looking for something more amazing than that. Right. Treachery, I'm looking for something more than, we didn't know Uncle Bob was the sideline all this time, but he was. <laughs> You can even give me a t- – I'm, I'm kind of even looking for tales from childhood and stuff. It doesn't have to have happened this year. It could be any time. So we're looking for tales of amazement, tales of treachery, tales of horror, tales of – um, what are other ones? Amazement, tales of love, tales of awkwardness. Mm-hmm. Send them in. Send them to Dicetower at gmail.com. We need some more. But we have some for you this time. Are we ready? I hope so. This is a lot of reading. Well, <laughs> for some of us. Hey, folks, before Eric does his tale here, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about our fundraiser because our next show is going to come out a day after we launch our fundraiser. We're launching it on January 2nd, 2017 at noon Eastern Standard Time. And I want you guys to be able to get involved with that. So if you want to know when it goes live, Go to our website, Dicetower.com, and at the top there's a banner that says find more information about our fundraiser. Click there, and it will take you to a page where you can put your email address in, and so we will notify you when it goes live. I'm not going to use this email for anything else. I have no desire to send out massive emails all the time. But if you like the Dice Tower, if you want to support us, we have some really cool promos. We've been posting them in forums so that you can see what's coming up. Either way, I'll talk more extensively about it in our next show. But I did want to mention it a bit here in case you want to jump in on it on Monday. All right, let's get back to that tale. Tales of Amazement. I recently attended my first gaming event with a local group, the Board Gamers of Akron. I was a bit nervous, but excited to get outside the comfort zone of my usual very small circle of game-playing friends. That day I learned code names and ink and gold, and got to play some old favorites like Stone Age. All in all, I had a great day. I made plans to attend their next event, but this time with my seven-year-old son, Noah. I was hesitant, as though he loves playing games with me, he hates losing. I don't know where he could have possibly gotten that from. I reminded him on the way there that if his behavior became inappropriate, we would have to leave. Shortly after arriving, I decided to check out their game closet to find something new for he and I to play. I grabbed King of Tokyo. I'd heard so many good things about it, and it looked simple enough. As I tried to read through the rules, I was bombarded with a chorus of monster noises as Noah played with the would-be kings of Tokyo. Mecha Dragon was the worst offender, continuously breathing fire on the rules and roaring loudly as I tried to get through them. Sensing Noah's impatience to start playing with these awesome creatures, I decided to teach as I learned, which was a very poor decision, as everything I said to him led to a question I didn't yet know the answer to. Just as my frustration was peaking and Gigazor clawed at my concentration, I was on the verge of behaving in an inappropriate manner myself. Fortunately, a kind fellow graciously interrupted, asking if perhaps he could teach the game to us. I readily accepted his offer of assistance, swiping the king off my back as he attempted to scale me. I could not have asked for a more patient teacher, who handled even the most irrelevant questions from Noah with delight. We were finally ready to play when the table next to us, finishing cleaning up their game of Castle Panic, asked if we would like to play King of Tokyo with them. Why, of course, this was precisely what I'd been hoping for. One of their group of three was an eight-year-old girl, who told Noah how fun this game was and how much he would enjoy it. Despite us both getting knocked out, Noah had a blast, as did I. He said how fun it was and how much he liked it despite losing, not a trace of poor sportsmanship in his voice or face. The day would have been a success right then and there had it ended. But there was time for more gaming goodness. The eight-year-old girl suggested Love Letter, a game Noah and I had played a couple of times. It didn't technically play five, but we didn't let that stop us as we agreed the first to three tokens of affection would be the winner. Fast forward a bit, and we each had secured two tokens from the princess. Both of Noah's wins came on the strength of his incredible handmaiden, handmaiden reveal the princess for the win strategy. I was happy he wasn't getting left out of the fun. 
As the last game came to a close, the final action fell to the eight-year-old girl's dad. As he surveyed the table displaying a guard, his daughter dejectedly mentioned she was not going to win. Noah comforted her by sighing and saying his final card wasn't very good either. Great, now I would be the target for his guard's inquiry as our fifth player was already out of the game. He asked if I had the princess, and I triumphantly showed the countess, declaring, No, but this should be good enough for the win. I was sure the princess was the beginning card removed from the game. A joyous laughter emanated from my son Noah, and I thought it odd that he would be so happy about someone other than himself winning. As I turned my head to him, I saw he was holding up the princess for all to see. His new friend, the girl, was excited as well, and her dad just looked at me stunned and said, That's the first seven-year-old I've ever seen with a poker face. I couldn't have been a prouder father. Huzzah! So we're basically cheering that we're teaching kids to lie. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Huzzah! <laughs> No, I think more it's the it's the cheer of the attitude. That's uh that's really good. I mean, I've I've had um King of Tokyo work well in this situation as well, uh with with getting my son to uh, to appreciate the fun of the game and not necessarily having to win. Uh he in the beginning would get very upset when I would beat him in a two-player game, even though it's a dice game. Like how can you really plan for that? Uh but playing with a larger group, he seemed much more willing to be out because he was having fun with the group. This is almost a sequel to two episodes ago. <laughs> our tales of... Our tales of uh, this tale of maze was very close to a tale of treachery, I think. <laughs> a little bit, yes. All right. Well, that was getting too happy. Let's ruin everything. And now, another tale of board gaming horror. Gather round. Children. After starting a closed gaming group on Facebook about a year ago, what started as eight members has grown to well over forty. After a year of discussing and enjoying each other's company surrounded by the topic of tabletop games, I decided to get a few of the members together. Some I had played with and some I had not. I selected carefully a few from my regular gaming group and a few of the individuals that I had been talking to closely, and invited them to a game night at my house. One of the members, we will call him Ted, like me, has been a long-time gamer. Two of the members are new to board games, and were introduced to the group from other members. I thought it would be great to invite them to cement the interest in this hobby. I decided as well to invite one of my friends, we will call him Jim an admin of the group who has been a gamer for many years. His focus is more war and miniature games, but I've played war games many times with him and thought his experience and knowledge would lend well to the newer players in the group. After talking to Ted, between us over 250 games to choose from, we agreed on three games to play at game night. Spyfall, to get everyone comfortable with each other, Shadows over Camelot to add an edge and introduce more modern game mechanics, and then a deeper step into Blood Rage. I was excited, as were all the members. We started by playing Spyfall. The group enjoyed the explanation of the game and were excited to play, but I noticed Jim, the most advanced gamer of us all, was struggling with the concept in the early games. It probably took a good five to six games for Jim to understand how the game was played. He didn't grasp the concept of the questions. I was confused. How could a player of such high caliber, someone who can calculate instantly complicated armor and damage rolls in War Machine and Bolt Action and other war games, as well as someone who, without him, I wouldn't be able to play some of these complex tabletop and miniature games— not understand how to play a game as simple as Spyfall. The games played on, and every time Jim was the spy, it was easy to tell who he was. He would ask ridiculous questions, burst into laughter, and couldn't handle the strategy of discreetness. Even when he wasn't the spy, he would ask questions that made no sense and laugh. 
Are there elephants where you are? was a question he asked several times across different locations. Puzzled and worried that the gaming experience so far is at risk for these new gamers who may be struggling having fun because Jim was so easily giving himself up, we moved on to Shadows Over Camelot. Ted set up the game quickly and explained the rules and the idea of the game. Worried Jim would do something silly to tell people he was the traitor or loyal knight, I made a comical comment. Jim... There are no elephants in this game, and when we look at the card, we look for five seconds and put it down. No laughing. Be careful. The room and he laughed, but I think most understood my point. We began the game, and again Jim was making terrible decisions. We would all be down to two life points, but Jim was at five and would place a catapult. Or move to a quest not take a heroic action there and move to another quest. He would go to the castle and draw cards endlessly, all white at times, bursting into laughter. Jim was extremely confused by our subtle language of the game. I can start the party with the Saxons, but I need to leave the party by Wednesday. Jim would look puzzled and confused, not understanding that we were not permitted to say, I can play a one, two, and three, but not the four and the five. Jim again refused to take a life point and played a catapult. We were pleading with him, trying to help him make decisions. We had only three spots left for catapults, with seven white swords on the table, just needing to fill the rest. Even with his blundering, we were able to, as a group, get this done quickly— But enough was enough, and finally one of the new players said, I am accusing Jim as the traitor. He will hurt us too much if he continues this. Jim again burst into what was almost uncontrollable laughter, gasping for breath to the point where I was almost worried for him. At this point we all agreed it had to be him, much like when he was the spy all those times. He had no poker face and we needed to remove him. But then... Jim turns over his card, bubbling laughter, a flicker of white on the underside of the card, and I thought it was not possible. He was a loyal knight. We lost a sword to the dark side, and only a few short turns later, the game. We sat in silence for a few moments, confused, bewildered. How have we been had in such a way? What was he doing? How can someone so intelligent be so off the mark? We moved on to Blood Rage, which was enjoyable. Jim, of course, dominated all of us in the game, and we enjoyed the night. No. Jim, of course, dominated all of us in the game, and we ended the night at 3 a.m., tired and still puzzled. Was this the work of a mastermind? Was it possible he was doing this on purpose to get to the game he wanted to play? My mind raced that night. Surely Jim, who I knew so well, was not intentionally trying to impact the new gamer's experience because he didn't care for the games we were playing. I made the determination that Jim is just quite mad. The new gamers still enjoyed their time, and we have planned other game nights. Thankfully, the power of the collective group was strong enough to overcome what I now call the night of the board gaming madman. <laughs> this is weird. I want I was hoping he was going to tell us what was going on. Uh, this is a mystery. I feel unresolved. Yeah, I I I I th- I'm I'm annoyed by that. I was hoping to get to the end and Jim was like I was on drugs the whole time or something. <laughs> now this this I'm I'm feeling gypped. I mean I I don't know what I I want to know why I'm trying to think of reasons why he would have been behaved. Spyfall I can get because it can be tricky to ask questions. Maybe he was just nervous doing the more social games, and and once he got to Blood Rage where he could sort of work within the system and not have to not interact outside of that system. It made more sense to him, so he did fine. But when there was, are you the traitor? Well, are you the traitor? When there's discussion going on, he just couldn't take it and just got all nervous and giggly. It's super weird. I 
I demand a follow up to this. <laughs> well, I mean, what, wasn't it Skip Hampton who said, "Maybe I'm the traitor, or maybe I'm just pretending to be the traitor"? I hate Skip Hampton. That guy's a jerk. All right, all right, all right. One more time. <laughs> Oh, and now, a tale of awkwardness. My family always gets together for the holidays. While it's always nice to see them again and have some great food, I've been noticing a problem within these last few years. My family was never very social, but as of late it has reached a new low. The instant dinner ends, everyone sits down and pulls out laptops or smartphones. Even if my parents put on a movie, a baffling amount of other glowing screens fill the room within less than ten minutes, and even my parents who chose the movie are turning to me asking, what just happened? I had to do something about next year, and then I looked upon my shelf of board games. Thanksgiving Day next year, the moment of truth was coming. I had packed code names, ticket to ride, and cash and guns. We were just finishing the last of our food. Dishes were getting put away. I was just about to make my move when suddenly my brother comes up to me. Hey, so I got a game the family can play. Did you know they still make You Don't Know Jack? I was so conflicted. My brother had noticed the same problem, and he apparently had arranged for us all to play this game as his attempt to fix it. What he didn't know was that I don't share the same fondness for the game that they did. I was always told I was too young to play it or even watch them play it back when we were kids. By the time I did get to play it on my own, years later, all it was to me was an annoying morning radio DJ voice making awful jokes and wacky trivia that never should have left the 90s. Perhaps you could say this disdain for it comes purely from salty years of being left out of family game nights, but the simple fact is I would not be sharing the nostalgia they all had for it. I told my brother I had brought some games and really hoped he would know of my collection being that he attended several of my game nights over the year, but he was convinced I could never get them to learn a board game. Maybe after this was the best I got from him. My parents worked on installing the app and setting up the game. On the TV screen, the trailer for the game began to play. That same radio DJ voice I grew to loathe filled the room. As if it knew my woe. In the trailer was a board game sure are boring joke that got a laugh out of the family. I pushed my backpack full of games under my seat, completely defeated by the flashiness of the new age of technology. And then I looked around the room, and there we all were, sitting on the couch, barely talking and looking at our phones all running the app. After a few hours of that, we shut the game off. Some laughs were had, an okay time seemed to be had by all, minus myself. My brother, though, realized everyone was slipping right back instantly into their old ways, having already been set up at their computers. He said that I had brought board games, seeing that I was getting ready to leave, but I knew it was too late for that. I told everyone I should probably head home, hiding the depressed look on my face, knowing I would never be able to get them into games. Not while my games lacked a wacky announcer and a glowing interface with four buttons. Shouldn't you cry here? I th I th I'm working up to it. <laughs> I don't know here. First of all, I, I, don't, I haven't played You Don't Know Jack for a really long time. Yeah. I remember as a teenager, I thought it was hilarious. I was really into it in college. That was, I wanted to show that to everyone I knew, and I thought the announcer was awesome. But anyway. I, I don't know. I... <laughs> This one is not so I don't I guess I'm 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 feeling like if all these people want to get on their screens and things, I don't know. It sounds like he's not even mentioning the, the board games. Yeah, so, well yeah. yeah. You know what he says like, Oh my brother beat me to the punch. Okay, great. And then once it's over, we shut the game off and then everyone went back to their computers. Right, And he said it's too late, so he went home. This is kind of like one of those things where, like, I wish people would play board games, but I'm never going to tell them about these board games. <laughs> yeah, he didn't really push for it. 
But this is where I would bring out the gun and point it at someone and be like, hey. And they're like, <laughs> what? I'm like, hey, do you want to play this game with these cool guns? Come on, guys. Let's try this out. Yeah. I mean, I've certainly been in the situation where I've brought a game and, and the the flow just never goes in that direction. And I know if I pushed it and even if they sat down, they wouldn't enjoy it. You know, if I was like, no, we're, we're playing a game. I brought these games. Everybody sit down and play. Then you'd get a bunch of people that were like, I don't know. If, if they're not receptive to it, it's not really going to be a good idea to push it. Okay. And I definitely agree on that. And I've done that too. You know, I've taken games to some places and the people never knew I brought a game. It was in the car. Mm-hmm. I said, if, if the right moment comes up, I'll bring it out. But it just was like, eh, this isn't the right moment. And right. I don't need to have games everywhere. And I just find it hard to believe that everybody, like I, I, I know some people are going to go get in their screens and that's it. I just find it hard to believe everybody. But you know what? I mean, if everybody's around playing, you don't know Jack, that's not a terrible time, is it? Right. Eh, maybe we're wrong. Tell us, folks. Sympathize with this guy because we're not doing a good job. <laughs> All right. Well, we got some time in the show. Questions. You know, we're almost out of questions, Eric, so we need people to send in tales and questions. Flood Ooh. us. Bring it on, people. I regret saying that. <laughs> or Eric will regret me saying that. Something. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, Mr. 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 Tom, uh, can you comment on the latest Essen releases? Where do you keep all your ties? If I threw water at you during a game, would you yell at me? And now Tom, the Dice Tower will authoritatively, have... definitely, Mr. possibly, Mr. maybe, answer your questions. Uh, 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 Tom, uh, uh, which way to the bathroom? So Ben has a question that, about... That, that... Let me start this one. You've been reading too much. Okay, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you need a break. Ben says he's been listening to our thoughts on legacy games for a while, and he understands that there's not that many. He wonders, could innovative games like those in games like Mystic Veil, vale, combined with things like clean white boards or multi-use notepads, lead to the possibility of a semi-legacy game? A game that allows for development over multiple sessions with stored progress, but with the possibility of resetting the game back. Like removing the sleeves or starting a new sheet on the eye on the pad. Obviously, the draw of any legacy games is the opening of secret envelopes. But do you think it's possible to create that draw in a format that combines the permanence and story arc of the legacy, but the long-term replayability of a normal "quote unquote" normal tabletop game? Is this what the Crossroads system from Plat Hat is attempting, but without the multi-session arc? No, the, that's nothing like the Crossroad hmm. system. He says, I guess one additional option could be the use of a phone tablet app to provide some of the new elements. Well, that's definitely what I was going to say. Yeah. Ben is answering his own question using a phone. But the Gloomhaven is supposed to be doing this, where you open the boxes. Even Mechs vs. Minions, you yep. go through and you open up the thing. Harry Potter is the same way, mm-hmm. where you go through and you open up stuff and you find this thing, but you could put it all back if you want it. Right. It is impossible for you to have a big surprise and then put it back and have that big surprise again. It just – you can't do that. Right. I mean, as, uh, and as we've discussed before, the – part of the draw of the legacy games is that surprise and is the permanence. Like you can't have a legacy game that can be dialed back. Otherwise, the consequences aren't as strong. The fact that you make a decision and you are stuck with it in a legacy game – is part of the reason for its existence. And if you have the ability to scale it back, it's not the same thing. It may still be perfectly enjoyable, as we've just discussed. A lot of those uh, those games are very fun. But it's not a legacy game. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. That's, that's, that's the answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> An app is a good idea, though. I mean, being able to s- essentially save your game. Here's the game state with this particular group. Oh, you want to start over with a new group? All right, fine. We're back to square one, and things operate this way now. True, true, true. Yeah. Our next question has a special needs son, eight years old, who's nonverbal, not particularly coordinated. He loves decks of cards. He destroys them when he plays, but thankfully decks of regular playing cards are cheap, and likes dice, particularly when they make noise like they would at the bottom of a bucket. So the strange question... What is the loudest and sturdiest dice tower that you've seen? One that I can chuck gobs of dice into and get a great sound. Any recommendations? I don't want to break the bank, but would pay as much as $50 for a great sound and sturdy product. The sturdiest dice tower I own 
and I would say it's fair to say I own a lot of them, mm-hmm. is a 3D printed plastic one. If you can get one of those, I mean, if you can get it printed yourself or find – there's some online that you can buy. Those are the sturdiest because they are a single piece. Well, a few of them are pieces put together, I guess. Right. But I have one that is a single piece. That's I don't know that you can get sturdier than that. Mm-hmm. But for cheap and expensive ones, very easily wooden ones. Um, e Raptors are pretty pretty sturdy. Mm-hmm. The plastic ones that we have, the ones the Litco ones, they're great and they're wonderful and they're fairly sturdy. But I don't think they are for this particular situation. But I let my two year old play with my almost all my dice towers, even my plastic ones, mm-hmm. and he doesn't break any of them. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only the only issue is dropping some of them. But if I mean, throwing the dice into them isn't going to do much. Um, you want to get one that isn't padded. I mean, many of many of the more expensive ones have felt or some sort of fabric on the baffles to make Shh. them not clatter as much. But you want to get a plastic or um, or or wooden one that's going to actually reverberate. If if you're going for the loudest possible result, play the noise. Do the noise. <laughs> All right. Our next question from Evan is several questions. He says he recently fought off the hordes of other gamers to get Mechs vs. Minions. He got it, and he's been happy with it. Fantastically overproduced. It's been a great game. It's the only game his group wants to play these days. Then he said he learned about the game on Dice Tower, and I mentioned that Riot retained my consulting services during development. So he had a few questions about that. He said, I've not previously heard of this practice. Is it common in the industry? Have you consulted on other games before outside the Dice Tower Essentials line? Um, I'll answer those backwards. Have I consulted with other games? I, I have, I guess, in a very unofficial capacity that hmm. I can think of. Um, I just would say, oh, this is what I think. This is what I think. I mean, that's what playtesters do. Right. A consultant is like a glorified playtester. It's not common to hire consultants riot does it because riot was made out of money (laughs) no i mean that's really the the i I think to some degree what it was when they first asked me to do it i was like really oh okay can i go to california cool (laughs) um so i i was only there for one day um and so he asked i'd love to hear some extended anecdotes about your experience of mechs vs minions is there any fun stories you can share with us it wasn't that i mean a lot of I guess I'm basically under an NDA about much of it, but it was just amazing to me to see the League of Legends headquarters and see just how big video games is compared to board games. Mm -hmm. My most fun experience was there's a great deli there. That was amazing. (laughs) An amazing deli. (laughs) Why is that funny? Uh, That's serious business. That's what you focus on. Yes. That's, That's always what I focus on. There was this amazing deli there. It's the best deli I've ever been to in my life. Sometimes I feel like if, if a publisher wants a really good review, they should just put a sandwich inside the box. That could work. <laughs> Except it would be pretty gross by the time I opened it. But Maybe if it was expressed no, I over have there. No, I've never been bribed by food, sir. <laughs> never. <laughs> but that would be a good start, I guess. No, but I, I, that's the thing. I can't really talk about much that went on there. But it was basically I was playtesting the game and giving them my opinions on it. Then his last question was, the game has a soundtrack available online featuring characters from the game. Portions of this are played at the start end and sometimes at spots within a scenario. It surprised me how enjoyable I found the soundtrack, which is not necessary to play the game, which is good, Eric, because I don't think I've ever played with it. Hmm. He says it only provides flavor and theme. Have you tried the soundtrack? And if so, what do you think? I have not. Have you, Eric? No, I have not. I didn't know it existed. I did not know it existed either. He says, are there other games out there that do something similar? He thought of Escape the Curse of the Temple and One Night Ultimate Werewolf, but those soundtracks seem intrigued to the gameplay rather than being just for fun. Right. Mm-hmm. Although technically you don't need the soundtrack for Escape. You just need the guy saying Escape and right. the gong. You, you can run it with a timer. It's possible. It's, it's annoying. You almost have to have a game master to do it. But Yeah, yeah, and that's so fun. you got to play it with the thing. Right. Um, almost every Flying Frog game comes with a soundtrack. Indeed. And with all due respect to the person who composed the soundtracks, the best thing to do with those is throw those in the garbage as soon as you get them. I don't like them at all. Do you like them? I, I don't think I've actually heard any of them. The only Flying Frog game I have is uh, the the space one, and I don't think that comes with the soundtrack. Mm. 
Wow. Um, other games that have soundtracks there are some games. I, man, I'm trying to think. I know there's games that have soundtracks for them. But oh, just as a flavor? I, that, that, that escape thing. That um, oh, the, the, the escape room game. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. That comes with like a, an app that has some like background music and or sound effects. Hmm. Interesting. So I play with that for a while. Then the kids were like, Dad, that's really tense, you know, tensing us up. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, we'll stop. So All right. Other than that, I, I, I think it's nice to have these things, but I just like having music, whatever. Oh, Matches of Madness obviously has a soundtrack in the background. Mm. That's very handy. So that's my answer, Evan. Okay. Kristaps says uh, one of his favorite games is Imperial Assault. When I introduce that game to new players and want to play a campaign, I use the popular legacy concept. I describe this game as a legacy type of game, where your choices lead to specific results. What I mean is new weapons, experience, next scenarios, and so on. However, recently I heard from you that only legacy games are Pandemic, Risk, and Seafall. So my question is, what differentiates games with campaigns, like Imperial Assault or Descent, from legacy games? Is it really the fact that you can break your components? What if the game achieves legacy elements without that factor? I think we sort of just covered this a minute ago. We did, but I, I want to be clear. Legacy and campaign are two totally different things. Right. Campaign has been around forever. All Role-playing games have all been campaigns, Descent, Doom. These campaign games existed for a while. You know, there's more of them now. I, I just... I, I would never describe it as a legacy game. It's a campaign, like a role playing game. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm a little confused as to why we're mixing these up. A legacy game was a, a story that actually has physical changes to it. Campaign games are like a role playing game, except it's a board game. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the legacy, the permanence is a critical element of legacy. Yeah, but even if permanence was a part of a campaign, it's still. It's these campaign games are where a group of characters are going through and accomplishing missions. It's a, it's a story they're following. It's just not legacy. I. Yeah. It's okay. Just, it's, Character it, advancement it, is not necessarily legacy. Yes. 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 It's it's a really long game that you're saving from point to point. Um, but and the next game is going to be different with different characters. And one game doesn't affect the next. Each, in a legacy, the games are completely different games. You're starting the game over again. But something that happened in the last game affects this game. Hmm. That, that's the truth, though. In Pandemic, Risk, and Seafall, all three of them, when you start a new game, it's you're starting the whole game over. But there's changes from the last game. Right. In a campaign game... You're going to a new place, a new thing. It's a totally different experience than the last scenario. Right. Yes. Nick says he's going to Origins next summer. He's been to a few local cons. What advice can you give me when registering? Do I want ribbons? My family's coming with me, but should I bring them to the con with me? Wife plays games, but not a huge gamer. Three kids, eight, six, and four. What advice do you have for a first-timer? Go to Dice Tower Cruise. Oh, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll tell you this. If your wife plays but is not a huge gamer, then I would schedule something else in Columbus besides just Origins. Hmm. I, I, I've heard. I have not been there, but I heard Columbus has an amazing zoo. True. Uh, there's some nice mini golf places in town as well. What did you do with your family besides games when you came? Uh, you my wife and the kids did, did, did one of the mini golf places. I don't remember if they did the zoo or not. But I, I do know they spent a day away from the convention center. Um, just, just to give everybody a break, uh, as, as one, one different thing to do rather than just hammering the, the game convention center every single day. Uh, that was, that was too much. So having a day, uh, maybe the one in the middle, uh, to escape was a good idea. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. And I might even take every other day off or do three days and have a day in the middle, not the convention. Hmm. Uh, with kids, I would recommend maybe finding some kid events and signing them up for them. Yep, there is a, a very nice kids' room. Uh, it worked differently this past year than it did the year my family was there. 
uh, but it's something like you know you spend a generic for every couple of hours, and it's a, a a nice activity room for the kids, and and well worth exploring for yeah. It looks like your whole age group, although the four year old probably won't be able to go in. Not even if you're in there with them. Um, maybe if you go in there with them. I know that that year my wife had to be with our youngest and could play games in there, but when she left, he had to leave. Whereas we could leave. Uh, my older child in the room for that particular period. Hmm. I um. Do you need ribbons? <sighs> if you're going to be with your family most of the time, I'm going to say no. Probably not. I mean the the uh, the cabs room is still, I think, worthwhile if you want to have a constant supply of players. To yeah, but know if he's that, bringing his family, I don't think it's a good idea. No, it's probably not. You, you'd get access to the library, but you can also do that in the various demo rooms um, and get an opportunity to play, you know, inexpensively without the ribbon. Definitely check out Yellow. They usually have Giant King of Tokyo there. Um, and some other companies will have some, like Mayfair, they'll have giant games there too. Mm-hmm. Kids tend to really like the giant games. Paul has been looking at the BGG Top Games list, and it seems that most games in the top lists are fairly new. In fact, 72% of the games in the top 50 were released in or after 2010. So my question is, are new games really that much better than older games, or are some of these high ratings the result of hype and people not knowing about some of the older titles? Yes and yes. Next question. Eric, you stole my answer. Ah, that's why I talk first. Yeah, that's actually true. Yes and yes. New games are that much better because they're building on the older ones. And yes, hype has something to do with it. And people don't know about those older games. But I think I think 72% of my top 50 were probably from 2000. No, maybe not. From 2005 and after, though, for sure. Mm. Sure. Jeff says, last night I had a dream where I pulled out my wallet to pay for something. However, when I opened my wallet, it was stuffed with hundreds of pieces of crummy Paper money from every board game imaginable instead of real bills. That's a terrible dream. (laughs) He says, do you ever dream about board games? What are your best dreams or worst nightmares about games? Wow. Okay. I know I've dreamed that I've gone to a convention and not been prepared. Mm. For sure. I believe I've dreamed about playing games before. But, you know, like if I play a game a lot. Like when I was playing like Descent or Star Wars collectible card game or whatever I was playing like when I was like doing those lifestyle games, I might wake up middle night thinking about combos for that game or dream about them a little bit. Uh, I don't like that. That's like mathematical dreaming. Right. Yeah, anytime you're doing some, some sort of repetitive action a lot, if you're playing a game a lot, I'll do this with video games sometimes. It sort of creeps into dreams. Uh, like when, back when I played Tetris a whole bunch, I would see those patterns in my sleep. Um, I don't know if that's happened with a game. I, I know I had a dream where I was happily playing a game with a celebrity that I, I can't remember now that for some reason was in my house. Who was she, Eric? It, <laughs> I never said it was a she. Um, yeah, okay. But that's, uh, I don't know if I have any gaming nightmares. It was Alex Trebek, wasn't it? it? It may have been Alex Trebek. We'll just say that and move on. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh sorry Eric's wife. <laughs> um I never said anything. Ryan says I'm a copy editor who's launching his own business that focuses on board game rule books and component copy. Ooh. I am building my I am building my business plan and working with a business consultant. During our appointment today, she told me I need to take into account that board game publishers might start forgoing physical rule books and replacing them with online rule books in the form of websites or even web apps, but specifically not PDFs. If that happened, copy editing in the board game landscape would change. She said that's happening now with coffee makers. As an example, now she doesn't understand the board game industry at all. In fact, she doesn't even know that it existed until I told her, and that's <laughs> perfectly fine. My initial thought was, no, that would never happen. Gamers like to pass the rule book around the table and we're a really finicky bunch. But as I thought about it, I realized that this could be possible, even if it feels unlikely to me. Do you foresee that happening to the industry? 
I'm going to say yes.、Mm. Well, I mean, it, it already is the case that most rule books are available online, and that does offer you the ability to edit said rule books on the fly after publication, which is something you can't do with the physical copy. I think it might be comparable. It's not a, a one-to-one comparison, but video games all used to come with rule books. That's true. They do not at all now because、Mm-mm. they use the video game to teach you the thing. There's always tutorials and such. I am seeing a lot more games coming with、uh, QR codes on them that say, "Don't read the rule book. Click here." Uh huh. And I would not be surprised if at some point some game that's all it comes with. Wasn't there? A, there was a game that did that recently. Yeah, we were really, people, we were were really mad at that game too. Yeah, <laughs> but that was like three years ago now that <laughs> that happened. What was, was the game? It was a while. It was some fighting game. There were different decks of cards, and they were like, "Yeah, we did give you the rule book. Find it online." And we were both like, "What?" But we are also older, Eric. True. You know, we talk about gamers being finicky and stuff. As younger gamers come into hobby, that's what they expect. Oh, we have to watch a video to learn this game. Okay. Hmm. And there's also that new company that's making apps that teach games. It was um XCOM. XCOM doesn't have a comprehensive rulebook outside of the You're app. You're right; it doesn't. And you know what? I didn't care.、Hmm. I was cool with that. That's really intriguing. You're right, huh? Yeah. It's a, it gave you some basic like setup rules, but that was it. You had to, if you wanted to look up a rule, you have to open the app. The app. Well, there you have it. Yeah. Hey,、I'm- wait! What's this? What? There's no more questions. We finished the year、What? with no more questions. That's. I don't think that's ever happened. We gotta okay, stop now, the it, episode before a new one comes in. It is very possible, folks, that you say, "Wait a minute." I have asked a question in the year 2016 <laughs> or <clears throat> or 15, and it never was answered. Which means we have purposefully ignored you. So, ask it again. Nah.、Uh. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, you can send it in again. There's a chance I missed them. We really did get literally thousands of questions, but we are now at zero. Wow. We have answered thousands of questions. I wish I'd kept track of how many questions we answered, because that'd be like a cool trivia number. That's a wits and wagers game. How many questions have the Dice Tower answered in their 488 episodes? Twelve away from 500. Well, I think we've answered twelve questions. Most of the time, we go, "Ah,、oh, that's an interesting question. What do you think? Let's talk about it on the forum." Yeah. <laughs> Hey, we, you know, maybe when we get to episode four ninety, we need to do like start doing a countdown. Ten, <laughs> nine. Don't forget, folks. We have a contest for episode five hundred. We'll probably mention it in a few episodes.、Mm-hmm. Don't forget our our fundraiser is around the corner.、Oh, Watch、boy. our website. It's gonna. You want to get in there and get in quickly. It's gonna be cool. I'm excited. I'm nervous. I'm excited. You're always nervous. But you know what I'm gonna do now? I said I was gonna do this last episode. But I'm actually gonna do it this episode. You're gonna blow something up. I don't know. I'm gonna go watch Star Wars. Oh, awesome! Which by this time is like old news. Everyone's seen it. <laughs> It's been several weeks. What did you think of it?、Uh, I I'm gonna say I liked it. Yeah, it was it was. I really liked that one thing that happened at the one point. Yeah, and when they did the Star Wars part. Ah,、oh, it was very Star Trekishy. W- what? That should tick some people off. All right.、Um, well, folks, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summer, and you've been listening to the Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number four eighty eight was recorded on December fifteenth, twenty sixteen. Coming up next week, what are our favorite games from five years ago? It's our favorite games from twenty twelve. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me, with assistance from Jason Thompson, Itai Perez, Eric Matthews, and Rob Searing. Poetry about underlings, written by robots, provided by Mechs vs Minions. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. 
Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including The Broken Meeple, Start Space, The Game Pit, The Long View, The Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast, and Board Game Blender. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, Happy New Year, and have fun gaming. Folks, it's 500 space oh reasons with an S at the end. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how to be clear about this. 500 space, R-E-A-S-O-N-S. I, it's mind-boggling to me. I don't know. Mind-boggling. I can't help you. I'll see you next year, Tom. Yeah, maybe. What? What? <laughs>